we are gathered together in the wonderful, majestic, victorious name of Jesus. And we're here to honor you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your glorious victories. Thank you for what you have done, that you did it for us. You laid down your life, and you rose again, and you gave us your Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, we just come into your presence now through the blood of Jesus, and we, Lord, we lay hold of all that you have for us today. Give us today our daily bread, we pray. Thank you for your provision for our lives today. Thank you, Lord, your steadfast love never ceases. Your mercies are new every morning. Thank you, Lord, for fulfilling your promise. We are gathered together in your name. Lord, let everything be to your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. morning church, morning family. Let's all arise and bless someone to your right or your left. start, I just uh, want just to share just a few words. Um, we're living in very interesting times, aren't we? And um, of course, you know, pastors spoke the imminent invasion of Israel, and um, I believe we're just on the, uh, on the verge of that, as Iran sent in drones yesterday to, um, to Israel, which is really a first, to be honest, and um, it's opening up the outer borders. So it looks like that prophecy is coming to pass. The inner borders are now the outer borders. So, so I just encourage you that we um, pray for our older brother Israel, regardless of their actions. So, so join us every Tuesday when we have our prayer, um, that we will stand with Israel. And the most important thing, of course, is that they know Yeshua as the Messiah. And, um, and, and that's the main thing that why we pray. We pray that they would come to know him. Because it says in the word that all Israel will be saved. But at the same time, it says that they are blinded in part. So we just press on sharing the gospel and the good news with them. That we may stand shoulder to shoulder with, with our older brother Israel. And glorify the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Amen. So let's, uh, let's come before him and proclaim the name of Yeshua. Amen.
give you praise and we give you honor this morning. He lifts up the name of Yeshua because we know that in no other name is there salvation. We look to you, Lord. We trust in you. We see the signs of the end of the time and we cling to you, Lord God. Help us to stand strong in these last days as we proclaim our God is greater. I 
our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God. Let's go back in time a bit here. We haven't done this for a while. Let's go old school. Hallelujah. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are holy. You are awesome. In your power. You have risen. You have conquered. You have beaten. You are mighty. You are mighty, you are holy, you are awesome, in your power, yes, you have risen, you have conquered, you have beaten, power of, let's rejoice. You are mighty, you are holy, you are awesome, in your power, yes Lord, you have risen, you have conquered, you have beaten, hallelujah. place, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's proclaim his healing power over us. He is the king of kings. He is the eternal one. He is the one who has washed us by his blood. Thank you, Lord. By your stripes, we are healed. Thank you, Lord.
sing Yeshua. Amen.
this, Lord. We proclaim this morning that we could search all eternity and we will still find that there is none like you. So, Lord, we lay down our lives to you. Keep singing it. Keep singing his name. Thank you, Lord. We proclaim your majesty this morning as we sing your name over our lives. Thank you, Lord, for your word that says those who bless Israel shall be blessed. So we speak a blessing over Israel right now, that they may come to know Yeshua as their Messiah, that they may come to know the one they walked away from. Lord, they say, I'm Jewish, therefore I do not believe in Jesus. But draw them, draw them by your greater love. Lord, it is your loving kindness that leads us to repentance. So, Lord, have your way in these last days. Have your way. Have your way. And we thank you, Lord, when you were just about to go to the cross in the Last Supper. It says that the one who, the disciple whom Jesus loved, leaned, leaned his head against his breast. And, Lord, this is John. And we thank you, Lord. We just pray today, this morning, that we would have a revelation of your love for us, that we know without the shadow of a doubt that you love us as you poured out your blood for us. Yeshua, Yeshua Hamashiach, Yeshua the Messiah. that let's just keep just keep worshiping God pray in the Holy Spirit sing in the Spirit
to you, Lord. Whatever goes on around us, Lord, we look to you. Hallelujah. You're always the same. Hallelujah. Yesterday, today, forever, you're the same. You love us with an everlasting love. Hallelujah. From eternity to eternity. We glorify your name, O God. Hallelujah. Let our life be a praise to you. Let our life be a thanksgiving to you. Hallelujah. Let our life be an act of worship to you, Lord. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Lord. Yeshua. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Well, God bless you. Do be seated. Very warm welcome to everyone in Oxford Bible, to Oxford Bible Church. Praise God. And a welcome to those who are with us on, online on, li by live stream. Um, praise God. We just want to welcome those with us for the very first time, especially. We want to give you our welcome pack uh, with uh, a good a free CD and all other stuff in here. If that's you, you're with us for the first time, could you just quickly wave your hand and uh, the ushers will find you. Just lift up your hand. There's a hand right at the back. Right at the back, that, that side. Is there anyone else? Just keep your hand up till, till, you, till you have been found. Anyone else? No? Okay. And there is a visitor's card. In, is a visitor's card as well. And um, if you are visiting, or maybe you're looking for a church, either way, if you would fill that out, that'd be great. Uh, there is an offering b basket by the door, and you can put it in there, or give it to to me or one of the ushers. And uh, we pray you'll be blessed with us today. Praise God. Uh, just a, a few uh, a qu quick announcements. Um, yeah, we've got, uh, please pray both for Camilla and her family. Uh, also, as we mentioned before, Ian, Ian Patterson and his family, um, their mothers uh, went home to be with the Lord this week. So uh, all... We believe all is well. Praise God. But that, yeah, do pray for Camilla and Ian particularly. Praise God. Um, I'll be on Q&A this, uh, this Monday, tomorrow, at 10 o'clock in the evening, if you, if you need to get more of me. Um, special event coming up uh, is, uh, is Answers in Genesis. Let me highlight this uh, in two weeks' time. We've got Simon Turpin. He's a top speaker from Answers in Genesis. Uh, he did come last year, and uh, he's going to be sharing, you'll see in the newsletter, on, um, yeah, the one controversial issue, of course, one race, one blood. Um, but I think we're all interested in dinosaurs, if, if we're honest. So... He's doing a message, and it will be after the main service in the community hall. And, and I think, I believe that uh, some snacks will be provided. Yeah, fr fruit and light refreshments will be provided. So there's an extra reason to, to stay. Um, the hospitality team, however, would like some extra help on the day and some extra food contributions. That would be most welcome. So this is in two weeks' time. Please see Judith after the service today, if, if you can help for two weeks' time. So we, we really want to have a great day at church and have, a, have a s a snacks. And then at about half past one, I think, um, we will go into the dinosaur talk. And again, it's, it's, let me encourage you parents, it's really important that your children get, you know, the, the, the biblical viewpoint on all these things. Like, the, the, what about the dinosaurs? It's a classic question, isn't it? So I'm sure that will be really interesting um, in two weeks' time. So do invite people as well for that. Praise God. Next Sunday, we're going to have communion, uh, and Simon Potter will be sharing with us. And uh, I'll be doing Psalm, 90, sorry, Psalm 51, 
this week. So if you need to repent and confess your sins, this is particularly a psalm for you. Um, it's David's a re- prayer of repentance after he sinned with Bathsheba. So uh, that will be posted on the Saturday, uh, Psalm 51. Um, let me see. I'm doing these notices a bit randomly. Um, but uh, let me get back on track now. Um, yes, so that's in two weeks' time. Now, the outreach team are going to be out again uh, in uh, Saturday, the 27th of April. That's almost two weeks' time. Four o'clock to seven o'clock on Bond Square. All are welcome to come along. They're, it's really good. Uh, some more people are, are joining in on these outreaches and being blessed. And they're also planning a week of door-to-door ministry in the Cheney the Cheney School area from the 22nd to 26th, like at lunchtime, uh, 12 to 1.30. So again, if you want to know more, if you want to join into that, um, you can contact Amit or Ruben. I think the numbers are there in the newsletter. And by all means, please pray pray for that. Pray for them in in these outreaches. Praise God. And also, we definitely got OBC International Day coming up this year. One of our favorite Sundays, Sunday the 7th of July, praise God. And so, uh, of course, this is a chance for you to come up and shine, maybe a song, whatever, whatever you got. You, we will have an international meal, bring and share, we'll have a big meal together and, and people will be doing their, their thing from the front while we're eating, praise God. And so also the weekly prayer meeting, of course, is on Thursday. And um, this evening service, we have an evening service, 6 o'clock. Jose will be sharing, I shall not be moved. That sounds good. Hallelujah. All righty. Now, is Christopher here? Because we've got one baptism certificate to give out. And I ask if is Christopher is here. Stand up and come forth. Welcome. Give him a clap. He was baptized couple of weeks ago. Hallelujah. Congratulations. Praise God. Christopher, fine young man. Hallelujah. Now, we have a testimony video that if we can get ready to show that, uh, you know about Karina, Mark Lau's daughter Karina and how God provided for her. Well, she's recorded her own uh, testimony, her own story. So let's let's do that, and we can dim the lights. That's right. Twenty nineteen, when my mum passed away, I. I couldn't believe that I felt so broken and so hurt. I didn't, I wasn't looking after myself. I then suddenly became really badly ill and my dad rushed me to the hospital. Then the hospital, they, the doctors, they diagnosed me with lupus and they told me that both my kidneys have failed. So when the doctors told me my kidneys are failing, they eventually started me on some medicine to prevent me from losing both my kidneys. Me being at a young age, I didn't take my medicine seriously. So then in a year's time, I lost both my kidneys and I got really badly ill and started having seizures. In that period of time, I can't really remember, but I remember my dad and my sister telling me stories when my sister found me having a seizure, so she called the ambulance. And I was put into intensive care for about a, a week, and then I was admitted shortly into hospital. When they told me I had to start a treatment called dialysis, they had to put to tezio lines in my chest and it was a wide awake procedure so I had to stay awake for that and all they did was numb me 
and I was so scared in that moment because I've never had a wide awake surgery before I didn't know how to react or like I was just so scared and nervous but when they took me to get in the surgery done um, they said I can listen to music to get my mind off it and I listened to worship music, I would listen to Waymaker and luckily the um, surgeon was Christian too so me and the surgeon were both like singing Waymaker and we were both were singing along whilst I was getting my surgery done and everything went well after that. Dialysis took a toll on me physically and mentally as I felt insecure about myself with the wires on my chest and I couldn't wear what I wanted to wear and I was scared if someone could see my chest or feel my wires and I also felt sad that I couldn't do as much stuff as I wanted to do or go out with my friends for long as I would have to go dialysis the next day or I would ha my whole life had to work around dialysis so and I couldn't go on holidays or do certain activities with my friends or family Dialysis physically drained me as I used to get migraines and I used to feel tired all the time so I couldn't do the stuff that I wanted to do. But yeah, I thought when I thought dialysis was just going to be a normality for me, it was just a part of my life, it was something that I had to do. I wanted to start doing more stuff with my friends so we were planning to go winter wonderland and on the 29th of december and we were all planning to go but suddenly around 12 o'clock i got the phone call to that i have a possible match for me there's a possible match for me for a kidney transplant and in that moment I was so excited and scared and nervous at all at the same time I felt so many mixed emotions but um, they just told me that I had to hurry up and come to the hospital so as we I quickly packed my bag and stuff and went to the hospital and they started I, as soon as I got there they started doing some checks on me like a COVID check test and um, other tests that they had to do and at that moment of time you because it, it was a possible match they I didn't know if that kidney was actually gonna be mine so it's just like a waiting game but then at around seven o'clock in the evening they told me that I need to stop eating and stuff so from then I knew that something was gonna happen and that they were gonna go through with the surgery and stuff and then I just became more scared and excited at the same time and then yeah basically I got a kidney transplant now <laughs> I want to say thank you for everyone for praying for me and for giving me all your love and support and keeping me in your prayers. It honestly means so much and I really appreciate it. This has been such a blessing to me and my family for the struggle I went through. From This is literally like a miracle and a dream come true. So I just want to say thank you. And I feel so blessed that the surgery went so well and there was no complications and I had nothing to worry about. And God has given me the strength to go through this. 
So this was my testimony. I hope you guys feel blessed and feel touched hearing my testimony. And I hope this helps you all see that God works in, in mysterious ways. He does miracles for everyone. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. And, and again, thank you for all your prayers. And we thank God that Karina has got a new start, a new lease of life. Praise God. And hallelujah. I'm sure she will make the best of it. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, yes, let me say one more announcement before we uh, move into prayer. Um, Pastor Abel, as you know, is with us for a few months, and I think he wants to spend more time in the UK. He um, has joined forces with 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 Vince, um, who and they want to. Uh, they've told me last uh, w week or two that um, they want to start a church in Bista, which they're calling Bista Bible Church, BBC, but uh, no connection really. And uh, they want it to be under OBC. They want it to be like a, a kind of campus of OBC. So, uh, yeah, so do pray for that. Pastor um, Abel and Pastor uh, Vince, um, they are starting by having a home group, um, a home group this Wednesday. So it, the announcement didn't come in time for us to put it in the newsletter. But uh, you can get the information from, from myself or or Pete, um, at the office. But they're starting a home group this Wednesday at 7.30 at 3 Lodden Close, OX 26 to a Z, as the Americans say it. Um, so, yeah. So if you live in Bista, if you're uh, watching online, you live in the Bista area, maybe you, you might want to go to that home group. And um, that is kind of the beginning of 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 getting um, this church off the ground. Do pray for them. Amen. Um, praise God. So let us prepare for a time of prayer. I just wanted to comment. I know Pete mentioned it. You know, I've, I t I've t taught on uh, Bible prophecy. And, uh, and as, as I see it, you know, there are prophecies concerning this time leading up to the tribulation and the second coming of Christ, and uh, prophecies concerning Israel coming back into the land, um, because God is wants to prepare her to bring... The prophecies say that she'll come back to the land before she'll come back to the Lord. That's just the order in which the prophecies show it will happen. So it's not a historical action accident that she's back in the land, but she's not in fellowship with the Lord yet. Um, but that God's purpose is to bring Israel back to God, as Peter was saying, so that ultimately all Israel will be saved. And, and it does predict, and Psalm 83 in particular predicts that she will face a number of warfares, a, a number of attacks, and uh, from the inner circle of nations around her. And then that will transition at some point to the prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and the first half of 39, which describes an attack or an invasion from an outer ring of nations, uh, you know, larger and stronger nations. And um, it, I, I, I'll just bring that up because I, I, in my series that I did, I was saying, you know, we're still in Psalm 83, really. Um, but at some point, it's going to move into, move towards the Psalm Ezekiel 38 scenario. And um, it's, it's, you know, what happened last night, and I know a couple in the congregation already came to me before the service and said, look, we're at a tipping point right now. There's this, what happened last night, you know, the, the attack from Iran, although in itself, you know, probably hasn't done much harm, yet it, it's, it's, a new, it's a new stage. It's... Uh, um, in, in, in that it's an actual, it, it's essentially an act of war. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an attack on sovereign territory. So before, there was always a little distancing because, it, you know, they, 
it was all be fighting through proxies. But now that was a direct act. So I think Iran doesn't want to get into a war necessarily right now, but they wanted to do something. But the thing, there's all these unintended consequences because there's a sense in which can Israel not do nothing now? You know, so maybe Israel's going to do something. So th it is at a very dangerous moment that it could escalate into a full-blown war. From, from the viewpoint of prophecy, it's, as, and Peter said it and, very well, and I, that clarified it for me. It, in a sense, this could be the moment when it actually moves from um, Psalm 83 to Ezekiel 38. So anyway, um, as, as, as a, it, I, I think I just want to mark that, that we might be at a, actually at a key moment of the un working out of uh, end time stuff um, right now um, because of what's, what happened last night. It's something new and, and it could trigger, um, it could trigger things. So that is really just not for so much for your information, but for a call for prayer, really. You know, do, do, it, 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 choose you this day. Yes. Make a choice to pray uh, because we're at a key moment in, the, in, in history. The end is getting closer and our part is, is to pray. We need to understand that certain of these things are bound to happen. They're destined to happen. But we believe God is working his purposes out. But we are to be part of God working his purposes out. And, and the number one thing is, is the salvation, really, of all the people concerned, all right? There is, there is, a, there is a battle, obviously, over, over, over God's kingdom coming through into the earth, God's will being done. There's a spiritual battle, and particularly there's a battle for souls. And so we, want, we need to pray for God's purposes to be done through this situation, however dangerous it seems, may become, that God's going to use this to bring... Israel back to the Lord, to their God, and also the other nations in, involved in the conflict, the peoples there, that somehow through this, God, they would turn to the Lord and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. But we are called to pray, and sometimes we don't necessarily always know what to pray, but we can always pray in the Spirit and just say, Holy Spirit, help me pray. I don't know exactly how to pray in this situation, but Lord, pray through me, Holy Spirit. And, and then just pray in the Spirit. So let, let me alert you to the, this situation. This may be a key moment um, in, 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 in things. So Jesus said, watch and pray. <laughs> in other words, be, be alert to what's going on. And, you know, don't be a passive spectator, but, but be a prayer warrior. Amen. Praise God. So let us pray. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. We pray. Oh, Lord, for Camilla and her family, Ian and his family, Lord, with the, the passing on of their beloved mothers, we pray, oh, God, for your special grace at this time, that you are especially with them strongly through these next few weeks that are, uh, that are going on, Lord, and, and that, Lord, somehow you will use this time and use the funerals, Lord, to, to draw the, 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 the families closer to you, Lord. Lord, thank you that you draw near to them at this time and bless them, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, O oh God. Lord, we pray for the visit of Answers in Genesis, Simon Turpin. We pray that this will have a big impact. Lord, that your truth in these key areas will, will come through loud and clear. Lord, that you will uh, establish our hearts in the truth, especially the young people, Lord, that they would know that the truth, the truths of Genesis in particular, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you for the outreach team, Lord. Just bless them in their outreaches to the area around he, this, this Cheney here, Lord, and uh, in Bond Square in the center. Lord, also those right now who are witnessing in, um, where is it, the Speaker's Corner, Hyde Park. Lord, just anoint them right now. Lord, protect them. Keep them safe. Lord, as they witness for you, Lord, bless them in the name of Jesus. Give them boldness. 
Give them boldness, we pray. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, and we thank you. Oh, God, we pray for the, the launching of Bista Bible Church, the house group this, this week. We pray your hand be on Pastor Zabel and, and Vince, that you will, you will bless them, that you'll add good people to them, that, Lord, that, that this will be for your glory, Lord. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for your hand upon them. In Jesus' name. Lord, we pray, O oh God, over the Israel situation. Lord, it, the, it is heating up. Lord, we just thank you that you are Lord over all. You're the sovereign God. Let your hand be upon, Lord, all those involved. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, O oh God. We pray especially, Lord, that through all the tribulation, Lord, that you will bring many to salvation. Lord, that they will bow their knees to you, Lord. Those in the Jewish world and those in the Muslim world, Lord, Lord, that they would both turn in the weakness, in the, in the fear. Lord, that they would turn to you, Lord, the living God. Lord, reveal yourself to them in dreams and visions. Lord, thank you that you are working your purposes out and your kingdom is coming to pass. We thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, praise God. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. If the worship team could come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do we need to release the children? We'll release the children and the youth now. And uh, praise God. Should we all arise? And amen to that. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.
Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, praise you, praise you, praise you, praise you. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we thank you. Oh, we thank you that we can call you Father in this place today. You've given us the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We thank you, Jesus. We call you Lord and Savior today. We thank you that you are our good shepherd. Hallelujah. And you are with us today for your name is also Emmanuel, which means God with us. And We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are our comforter and our counselor and our friend. And I thank you that you are the one who helps us in our infirmity and weakness, and you're with us today. I pray that you would move among these, your people, and speak to their hearts through me, minister your word, your grace to them, and help me to speak as you would have me do. And for all that you do in our midst today, Father, we give you all the thanks and praise for it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Praise God. Pastor Derek wanted me to... Uh, just remind you that there is an Israel prayer meeting uh, every Tuesday, so it will be happening this Tuesday, 7.30 by Zoom. Uh, the information in the, is in the newsletter, how you can uh, connect with that, so we do uh, take part in that if you can. And uh, Before I get into the, the word, let me say uh, happy birthday. Oh, she's happy birthday to our, our flag bearer. It is uh, Tori's birthday today. Happy birthday, Tori. You, you, I thought you were going to be sat there, but you timed it absolutely <laughs> perfectly. So well done. Well done. <laughs> God bless you on your, on your birthday. We celebrate with you. Amen. Praise God. Before I, I, I get into the Word and preach the, the message that God has given me today, the I, I, first thing I want to do is I want to actually publicly repent. And this is not inspired by Pastor Derek talking about Psalm 51, by the way. Um, but uh, something that I, I wanted to say just in the beginning, Pastor mentioned that there are uh, uh, a group today, there's a group who have gone to Speaker's Corner in London. And last Sunday when Jason came up here along with David Alsnet and they were talking about that, when they went back to their seats, they, uh, David had been talking about the uh, uh, w what it can be like on, on Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park and how, uh, you know, people can be confrontational and get in your face and, and even raise their voice at you. When they, when, they, when they moved away and I came up here and took the mic back, I made just an off-the-cuff remark about, uh, what, what, you know, well, if you fancy having people shout in your face, then uh, why don't you go along and, and join them? And no sooner had I gone back to my my chair over there, I regretted such a thing coming out of my mouth. Because, you know, that, that is the kind of thing that will keep some people away. That's the kind of thing that will keep some Christians quiet. The thought that if they open their mouth and say anything about being a Christian, somebody might get in their face. Somebody might be disagreeable. And I, I just felt grieved in my spirit, and I said, oh, God, let me not be a stumbling block to somebody telling the truth about you. Let me not be an excuse for somebody to say, oh, well, if they, if they get loud and they get aggressive, let me not say anything at all. And I, and I hope that there is nobody in here today who might otherwise have gone to Hyde Park with Jason today, but you're in that seat right now because what I said has put you there. So before I even get into the Word of God today, I want to look you all in the face and publicly repent of that foolishness that came out of my mouth last Sunday. Because what this hour needs more than anything is you and I who are in Christ to be bold enough and courageous enough to stand firm in the truth no matter who comes against us or speaks against us. Amen? I can remember a time... Some, I suppose it was about seven or eight years ago, when I was actually with Jason on Corn Market Street in the town center, 
And we were doing, uh, with a group of other people there, we were doing street outreach. And I remember I took the microphone and, and began to, to preach the gospel that day. And there was a man who was most terribly offended, who, with his shopping bags in either hand, sort of flapping as he stormed over to me, came right into my face and was bellowing at me to be quiet, to stop saying what I was saying. And I'm not kidding, we were practically nose to nose. I can still see his face, the, the elderly gentleman, straggly silver hair, and nose to nose with me, and yelling, yelling in my face. And I mean, all I could do was to just, just smile, you know? What else am I going to do? And, you know, the thing is, we can't let that hold us back from shining the light of truth. None of us would be here if the first Christians were that timid. None of us would have come into the kingdom of God. None of us. None of us would be in this church today had they not prayed for boldness. Had they not had the courage to step out and speak out. And you and I at this hour have to have that same courage and that same boldness. And we can't let the, the fear of somebody being disagreeable towards us keep us silent. Amen? Because, you know, it, it, it needs courage in this hour right now. It needs, it needs boldness in this hour right now. We're going to see in, in a moment in the scripture, it, it requires that, that steadfastness. If we're, if we're going to really represent our king, and, it's, and we need to do it out there. It's easy in here. It's easy in here. The, these walls are very comfortable. They're very safe. But what about out there? Because, you know, we, we can't let fear paralyze us. Because fear is the thing that keeps us back. Fear is the thing that holds us back and stops us from doing it. It's funny, isn't it, that when we're inside the safety of these four walls, we can lift up our hands and say, I'm sing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child to God. And Pastor Derek can stand up here and read out of Timothy that uh, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And we can say amen. And then when we go out there, it might be a different story. But we need to have that boldness in this, in this moment. Amen. Praise God. So if you've got your Bible with you, turn with me today to Philippians Chapter 3, praise the Lord. My title of this message is Citizens of Heaven. Praise the Lord. I'd be grateful if you would silence your phones. That sounded like Alexander Scurby reading the King James Audio Bible. Anybody know about that? That voice is unmistakable. Citizens of heaven, and we're going to read from our main text, Philippians chapter 3, from verses 17 to 21. Paul writes and says, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. 
And Paul says in the 17th verse uh, that we ought to follow in his example because the Apostle Paul for you and I is a good example of a Christian character and maturity that we should emulate and imitate and follow. He is a good example. He's not a perfect example. He himself would uh, no doubt admit freely that he, he was not a perfect example. The only perfect example is Jesus Christ himself. But Paul is a good example, and he encourages us to mark him and others like him as good examples and follow them. It's always good to make note of those uh, Christian men and women around us who are who are doing this thing right or doing this thing well and being imitators of them and following after them. And uh, Paul gives us his example. He shows us what his example is and how and, and what it is we're to follow in the verses that precede this in chapter 3. And he tells us in uh, verse 3, uh, Philippians 3, verse 3, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. And some manuscripts uh, translate that, who worship in the Spirit of God. Oh, praise the Lord, when you and I worship as we have been doing this morning, we do it in the Spirit of God. We do it with the power, with the influence, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, praise God. And it's, he says, we also rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, no confidence in natural ability, no confidence in what I can do in and of myself, no uh, confidence in my natural effort. And that totally contradicts the mantra of today, doesn't it? Everything in today's society, particularly here in the West, is all about how you and only you can do it for you. And if you just tap into the hidden power of you, you can make things happen for you. Uh, how many people have been hearing this word manifest more and more uh, among the non-Christians? Let me tell you, before I became a Christian, I don't know if that word manifest was ever in my vocabulary, that I ever came across that word at all. And of course, coming into the kingdom of God and getting saved, uh, I, I realized this was a, what I thought to be a Christian word, something to do with our Christian faith. But you know, recently, in recent months, in over the past year or so, more and more I've been hearing those who have no relation to Jesus, nothing to do with the Bible, nothing, uh, no part in the kingdom of God, out there in the world talking more and more about manifesting tapping into the power that's in themselves to manifest their hopes and dreams. If they just can visualize uh, who it is they want to be, where it is they want to be, what it is they want to have, and they just concentrate really hard and all this other stuff, then they can manifest. And I'm, I'm seeing that word more and more appearing in a non-Christian, non-church context. They can manifest. If you can just visualize it, you can manifest. But you see, the problem is visualizing is not what produces manifestation. Having, having the vision of something, visualizing something, is neither here nor there. Because, because having the vision and having the, the image isn't what brings about the manifestation. It's, it's when you have that vision, when you see that image, then you have to reach out and connect with some power somewhere that is going to manifest that image. Did you hear me? And so the question is, what power are you reaching out to and laying hold of in order to manifest what you're seeing? It's good to have a vision, to see a thing, to conceive a thing and be able to see it. But it's, but it's not the seeing of it that brings about the manifestation. It's then the tapping into power that brings about the manifestation. And all of these people out there in the world right now talking about manifestation, they're tapping into power, but the wrong power source. And I'm hearing this more and more and more. But this is, this is the philosophy of the world right now, that it's all about you, it's all down to you, and only you. But Paul, who had a, a huge list of qualifications and accolades and attributes, said... The one thing I absolutely do not trust, the one person I absolutely do not trust is me. I have no confidence in myself whatsoever, even though I've got an enormous list of things in which I might place my hope. My only boast is Jesus Christ. The only star in my sky 
he says, is Jesus Christ. And I hold to him and to no one else. And as you know, Paul then through the rest of chapter 3 lays out how he lets go of all those other things in order to lay hold of Christ alone. And he doesn't even look back at all those things behind him, but has this forward-looking focus to do nothing else but to lay hold of that for which Christ laid hold of him. And he says that this is the example that you and I should follow. And Paul was humble enough to say that he was not the only example. You know, it, it being an apostle of his stature, the apostle who was really the chief apostle, the apostle who went further and did more than any other apostle, it would be quite easy to, for him to say, well, in the kingdom of God, to me, I'm one of one. And uh, you, if you want to imitate anybody in this Christian life, take a look at old Paulie over here. But he doesn't do that. He acknowledges, you know, it's not just me. There are others who are walking just like I'm walking. And you, you Philippians, mark them and, uh, and follow and imitate them. Because he says in verse 18, <clears throat> he says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of of the cross of Christ. There are many enemies of the cross of Christ, and he's not talking about outside there. He's talking about inside the church, within the walls of the church, sitting among the congregations somewhere, in some places, in some parts, there are enemies of the cross of Christ. And he said this, weeping, weeping, and it, it was such a thing that it brought the Apostle Paul to tears. My good friend Charles Spurgeon, who is the undefeated world champion of quotations, said, said this when he was thinking on the, uh, the, the, the weeping of the Apostle Paul over these enemies, uh, and this is pictures number one and two, media guys. Uh, he, Spurgeon said this, picture number one, he said, I never read that the Apostle wept when he was persecuted, though they plowed his back with furrows, I do believe that never a tear was seen to gush from his eye while the soldiers scourged him. Though he was cast into prison, we read of his singing, never of his groaning. He goes on to say, I do not believe he ever wept on account of any sufferings or dangers to which he himself was exposed for Christ's sake. So I call this, this, this weeping over these enemies, he says, I call this an extraordinary sorrow. Because the man who wept was no soft piece of sentiment and seldom shed a tear even under grievous trials. He said, what a thing it must be that it brought the Apostle Paul to tears when he considered these enemies of the cross of Christ. It brought Paul to tears when he considered the damage these enemies were doing among God's people. It brought Paul to tears when he considered the the fact that these ones who were so close to the truth had no part in it. And as he says, their end, in verse 19 of our text, their end is destruction or their end is perdition. These ones who are still with us today in some churches somewhere, these enemies of the cross, to think it inside the house of God, enemies of the cross. They stand in pulpits. They lead churches. They wear the very image of the cross around their necks, maybe. And they are enemies of the truth of the cross, the authority of the cross. They are enemies of the message of the cross, having uh, made their God their belly, not necessarily their stomach, but but their own self-satisfaction or their own contentment, their, their own... Uh, uh, a state of ease or comfort without any disturbance among uh, people around them. And he's, Paul says their glory is in their shame. They celebrate the things that they should be ashamed of. Isn't that the case even in this country among certain Christian leaders who, who are celebrating and rejoicing in attitudes and, and ways of living that should make their heads fall in shame? Because they've set their mind on earthly things. They've set their mind on, on just fitting in with everyone around them. And uh, not being a square peg 
in a round hole. It's interesting what uh, William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said at the end of the 19th century as he looked towards the 20th century. William Booth said, this is picture number three. He said, the chief danger that confronts the coming century, and he was talking about the last century, the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. And it's, it's like he came and paid us a visit in 2024 and, and went back there and, and, and spoke those words a hundred and some years ago. Because this is, this, is, this is what we are experiencing now in some parts of Christendom. Uh, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. We don't want to be such people, hallelujah. We don't want to be such people. And we don't want to be such people because our true citizenship is in heaven. Paul contrasts these ones who are the enemies of the cross of Christ with those who truly stand in Jesus Christ. In verse 20 of our text, he says this, for our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says that we are citizens of heaven. And I want you to think about that for just a moment. And as we're thinking about it, turn with me uh, to Ephesians chapter 2. Second chapter of the book of Ephesians. Paul says we are citizens of heaven. And we know these verses very well. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 says, And you... Yeah, he's talking about you, friend, the big divine finger of God pointing at you right now, and you. What, me? Yes, you, and you, it says. He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. He says that we were dead in trespasses and sins, dead because of them and dead in them, producing nothing but more death, a a factory churning out trespasses and sins and no ability to do anything else. For the prophet says that even our righteousness was as filthy rags in the sight of God. So uh, Paul says that the... uh, the course of this world. We once upon a time walked according to the course of this world. And you know, the course, the direction of this world is towards trespass and sin. That is the direction that this world is moving in. Where are we going as a human race? Where are we moving as a human society? People might be wondering. The boffins might be thinking. Where are we going right now as a, as a human society, as human civilization? I can tell you where. The same direction that we've been moving since the Garden of Eden. We're moving in the direction, the course of this world is towards trespass and sin. What flowed from Paul's pen 2,000 years ago in, when he wrote these words is still true now and nothing has changed it. Empires have risen and fallen in the time since and nothing has changed it. Societies have collapsed and been built again and they've collapsed again and they've been built again and they've collapsed again and they've migrated over there and been built again and nothing has changed it. The course of this world is still towards trespass and sin. The enlightenment hasn't changed it. The industrial revolution hasn't changed it. The technological age hasn't changed it. I tell you, nothing has changed it. Modernity hasn't changed it. The space age, the uh, digital age have not changed it. Legislation has not changed it. Diversity and inclusion hasn't changed it. Tolerance hasn't changed it. Liberalism hasn't changed it. Nothing at all that mankind has done has changed the course of this world, which is still towards trespass and sin, rebellion against God. And he says, according to the prince of the power of the air, speaking of Satan, the one who uh, caused this course to be set in the first place back in the garden, 
the spirit who now freely works in or influences the sons of disobedience. And he says that we were part of that. You and I were once among that number. And he says at the end of verse 3 that we were by nature, by nature, the children of wrath. But look at what happened even then. When we were in that state and we were by nature the children of wrath, it says in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For what end? That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. I want you to think about what it is that we just read. It said that we were, by nature, children of wrath. By nature, we were the objects of the wrath of God on account of our sin. Because of our sin and our trespass against God, we were the objects of His wrath. There is no more dangerous, horrifying position to be in than to be the object of the wrath of God. But God, but Jesus Christ. I gave an illustration last Sunday evening. I feel like I need to do it again. Darren, will you you just come and join me up here? Usually, Pastor Derek is calling me. Today, I'm up here doing the calling. No, no, no. We're not going to wrestle. It's okay, brother. It's okay. You don't need to lie down either. It's okay. <laughs> if, if you just come and, just come and stand, stand about here. So here, this is, this is where we, And this is true about you, brother. You, you were right here too. Objects of the wrath of God. And, and you might say, what? Even this sweet boy? The Bible says all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. As as good as he may have tried to live in and of himself, he was the object of the wrath of God. And so here's God pointed towards this one who is in rebellion against him. And this one is the object of the wrath of God. You You are under the judgment of God. And it's just a matter of time until that judgment reaches out and gets a hold of him. The object of the wrath of God, but God, I'm going to call my friend Peter Mandrup right here, but 50, more than 50, about almost 20 years ago, we did, we did a skit where we, the champion, where I was God the Father, and he, he was Jesus Christ, so since he knows how to play the role so well, but God sent his son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life on a cross, he does it so well. And he came between the wrath of God and this one who was the object of it. And as Pastor Derek said, all that judgment alighted upon Jesus Christ. He became the one upon whom that judgment fell that should have gone upon this brother right here. Yes, all of the judgment that should have gone this way was now diverted to this innocent, holy Lamb of God who took our place on the tree. And this is what the scripture means when it says that he is the propitiation for our sins. Some of you might have read that word in your Bible and said propiti. What? He is the propitiation for our sin. Which means that because Darren was the object of the wrath of God, and God had no choice but, but to judge sin, That judgment was going to fall on him. But because of the Holy Lamb who stepped in between Darren and that judgment, instead of that judgment falling upon Darren, it fell upon the Son of God. And it meant because the Son of God took all of that judgment, it enables the Father now to be entirely propitious, favorable towards Darren. And so this Holy Son of God, if you just come and stand behind See, now, he's got a hold of him. Darren, (laughs) 
Oh, thank God the Son of God holds us that tight. And he won't let us go. And so now, because Darren has believed and put his confidence in what Jesus did for him on the cross, there's no more judgment coming your way, brother. There's no more judgment coming your way because the Son of God took it all. And now when the Father looks at you, he sees the Son. He can't help because you're so closely unified and identified with one another because you are in Christ. When the Father looks at you, he sees the Son. When he looks at the Son, he sees you and all of you who are in him. Hallelujah. And look at what it said. Just wait there a moment longer. Look at what it said. Those of you who were the objects of the wrath of God, without doing anything yourself to remedy it, without doing anything yourself to change it, without doing anything yourself to get out under it, without doing anything to yourself to fix it. It says that because now we are in Christ, what has happened to us? What has happened to us? It says that verse 7, Ephesians 2 verse 7, here's now what we're the objects of, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us. His kindness. Darren, you are now the object of God's kindness. And nothing but his kindness. What does God have for me today? Kindness. 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 And, and forever and ever, for eternity. Kindness. Kindness. Kindness and love, mercy and grace, help and strength, kindness. He's now the object of God's kindness. And any one of you in here who belongs to Jesus Christ, you are the object of God's kindness today. You may sit down, brothers. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. This is what Christ has done for us. We were the objects of judgment and wrath. But because Christ stepped into the breach and took our place on the tree, we are now the objects of nothing but the kindness of God. The objects of his kindness. Oh, praise the Lord. And he's made us citizens of his kingdom. Ephesians 2, moving on to verse 17, it says, And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and to those who were near, to both the Jews who were right there and us Gentiles who were so far away from him. He came and preached peace. For through him, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit to the Father. Hallelujah. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We are citizens of heaven, friends. You and I today, we are citizens of heaven. Picture number four. A citizen. A citizen can be defined as a legally recognized subject or member of a nation state who has all the legal rights and protections of that state. A legally recognized subject or member of a nation state who has all the legal rights and protections of that state. And because of Jesus Christ, we have all the legal rights and protections of the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Oh, I want you to think about that. We are citizens of heaven. On our own, we couldn't even get across the border. By ourselves, we couldn't get in. But because of Jesus Christ, we haven't just come in. We've been made full citizens and legal sons of the kingdom of God. And it happened the moment that you believed. Some of you sat in this room today, became citizens of this nation after taking a test you had to take a test to become a citizen of this nation. And even right now, the memory is coming back of how you were pacing about, trying to remember who won the Battle of Hastings, sat on your bed, pulling on your socks, trying to remember what was Winston Churchill's favorite flavor of jam or whatever question they had. 
on that test that you had to sit down and do and you had to revise and study and learn all about the history of this nation. My goodness, you had to learn about things even those of us born here don't know. So that you're more qualified to tell the history of this nation than those of us who were born and raised here. And you did all of that to become citizens. And finally, once it was done, stamped, here you go, here's a British passport, congratulations, you are a citizen of the United Kingdom. And that's how it was done. Oh, but we became citizens of heaven from day one. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? That when you got on your knees that day and said, dear Father in heaven, I ask you to forgive my sins. I give my life to Jesus. I want to be a Christian. Aren't you glad that in that moment the angel Gabriel didn't show up with a clipboard and pen and a chair and a folding trestle table and just, and just sat you down and said, right, now let's do the test before you come in. Just write down for me four examples of the communicable act attributes of God. And then question number two, write down four incommunicable attributes of God. And then explain to me in, in 50 words or less the hypostatic union. And, and you, you just want to cry and run away and say, what is, what is this? I didn't sign up for this. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad there was no test no entrance exam, no questions you had to ask. You just came as you are, broken mess, bits and pieces, all worn out and tired out and battered and beaten up, came to Christ and said, here I am, this is all I've got. I've got, no I've got nothing to contribute to your kingdom. I've got no skills or talents that you can make use of in your kingdom apart from you. It's just, old, it's just little old me. And he said, come on in. And not only that, he made us full citizens of the kingdom from day one. Full citizens with all the rights and privileges of citizenship. Congratulations, Newcomer into the kingdom of God, you are a citizen of this kingdom. Here are the keys to the kingdom. There you go. Exceeding great and precious promises. All the law of this kingdom. Here you are. It's yours. And, and it will be fully backed up by the king of this kingdom every step of the way. Here is the name of the king himself, which is now yours to use anytime you like. It will give you direct access to the king. My goodness, I was born and raised here. I can't just go and see King Charles anytime I like, but I can go and see King Jesus any moment of the day. Hallelujah. All I need to do is open my mouth, and I'm right there. He's given me the name of Jesus, which gives me access to the presence of the king, and it gives me access to all the resources of that king to use here in my life on earth. And just in case you, you thought when I said me, I was only talking about me, I'm talking about you too. Citizens from day one. But you know, we live backwards so many times, so often we live backwards. We live the wrong way around, I think. We live from earth to heaven. We live rooted in this earth, thinking of heaven as this place that, well, one day, someday, I'll get there. Uh, at, the, at this moment, I'm tied into this earth, but one day, I guess, I, I'll, I'll be lifted and carried up there to heaven. What if we live the other way around? What if we lived from earth to heaven? What if we got up in the morning and recognized, I am a citizen of heaven. I am a heavenly man. I am a heavenly woman here on this earth. So rather than standing here rooted on this earth, looking up to heaven and going, well, one day in the by and by, I'll get up to that place. What if we approached living in this earth saying, I'm coming with all of heaven in me, working through me, all the rights and privileges of the citizens of heaven in operation in my life? How would our lives look different if we did that, friends, praise God. Isn't that, isn't that what we pray? Jesus taught us to pray. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So what, what does that mean? Does that mean that we pray, oh, Lord Jesus, your kingdom come? And when we say amen, we just wait for the kingdom like looking like this. Ian, can you see it? 
Like we're expecting some meteorite to fall out of the sky, waiting for the king. There it is. I see it. There comes the kingdom of God. It's No, how is that kingdom going to come? It's going to come through us. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. And yes, that means that the kingdom of God is in your midst because the king, he himself, was standing there with them that day. But I believe also when he said the kingdom of God is within you, he was telling us, don't go looking around for the kingdom of God. It's right here, believer. It's right here. It's right here. And we have, when we pray, your, your kingdom come, your will be done. In earth as it is in heaven, and we're bringing heaven to earth, it's going to come through you and I. Oh, if we would just believe it. If we would just believe it. Yes, we're heavenly people living on the earth. Have I ever told you how much I hate clocks? Let's go back to our text in Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. Praise God. We are citizens of heaven through Jesus Christ and his grace. Philippians chapter 3. Paul said we are our citizenship, verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Eagerly waiting for the Savior. He says we eagerly wait for the Savior. And that word uh, eagerly waiting is the Greek word apek dekomai. That's picture number five, guys. I think that's the last picture. Picture number five. Apek dekomai is the word which is translated here, eagerly waiting. Apek dekomai. And it's a, it's a combination of apo, which means away from, to be away from, and dekomai, which means welcome. Away from, welcome. So it, what it's trying to communicate is, a, is the kind of welcome that it puts everything else away. It, it's, it, it, it's this idea of craning the neck and, and stretching oneself to see, is it there? Is he coming? Is it happening? And, and not allowing anything else to be clutter and get in the way. So it, it's not a sort of idly sort of passing the time while you wait, you know, playing about with your, you know, your phone or fidgeting with, you know, the remote control in your hands. Anybody do that when they're, you know, you know I'm a fidget. I like to, you know, I always, I, I don't think I ever watch telly or anything without a pen or something in my hand that I'm just, you know, occupying my hands with. But this apec decumai is the kind of waiting that just says, right, everything else back here. And I'm, I'm just craning and stretching in anticipation. And this is the word that Paul uses. And often throughout the New Testament, this expression is used in context of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll give you just a few scriptures. Romans chapter 8, verse 19. You don't need to turn there. They'll appear on the screen. Romans 8, verse 19 says, For the earnest expectation... Of the creation, eagerly waits apectectomai for the revelation, for the revealing of the sons of God, which will of course happen at the manifesting of Jesus Christ. Oh, there's that word again. Romans 8:23 says, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, the transforming of our body, which will come when Jesus Christ returns. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 say, Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting, apec decomai, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And apec decomai is, uh, is fitting as an expression for this eagerly waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because what other event do you think is more deserving that people put everything else to one side, put everything else behind them, and crane and stretch at the neck to see, is it happening? Is it coming? Some of you might remember what it was like when you were children, and one of your parents was coming home. Perhaps your dad was coming home from work, and there you were at the window or at the gate, stretching and craning, waiting. Is he coming? Is he on his way? I can't see him. I'm waiting. And you're almost stretching yourself out of your shoes as you're stretching and craning to see, is he coming? 
And it's a fitting term because this is what we ought to be in anticipation, excitedly waiting for the return of the Lord. But in truth, how many of us really do wait for the Lord like that? Or do we just have this kind of intellectual assent that while he's coming back, we know it, we believe it. Look, don't get off my case, Hockley. I believe he's coming back. I'm not trying to get on anyone's case. I'm talking about myself more than about you. Am I really craning at the neck for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? We might have missed something here. Not, not just of the wonder of what it would be for Christ to return, but the importance of it. Have you ever thought about how right it is for the Lord to return? Just the rightness of it. It is right that Jesus comes back. Because right now there is a usurper, we read about him, the prince of the power of the air. Right now there is a usurper who rules on account of thievery and treachery and stealth and deception. This thief has seized control of what is not his to control. And right now there is misery and there is suffering and there is cruelty and there is wickedness and there is evil and there is death in the world that God looked at and said is very good. It exists right now. So yes, it is right that Jesus Christ come back. How can it not be right? How can it be anything other than the most needed, the most urgent, the most just and proper thing for the Prince of Peace to come back into this world and establish his righteous reign on it? That the glory of the Lord really would fill the earth like water the sea. For time's sake, let's move on to Philippians chapter 3. And verse 21, Philippians 3, 21, speaking of this return of the Savior, says, He will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. Praise God, we will have a body like His when He returns. A body that is not subject to decay or death. A body that is without limitations of time or barriers of distance or any such thing. A real body, yes, but a body that is fit and suited to the conditions of heaven. And it will be the final manifestation of the fullness of the salvation which is ours. We have full salvation today, but we're not experiencing it in fullness. And we won't experience it in fullness. Derek Prince called this the consummation of our salvation. No matter what else of our salvation we enjoy, this one element we won't get to have until that moment, the transforming of our very body. No more sin nature whatsoever. No more tendency in trending towards the flesh and carnality whatsoever. Pure and holy. I I know that... It's healthy to look in the mirror and see yourself in the mirror and think, I kind of like what I see here. This is pretty pretty groovy. This is pretty awesome. I kind of like who's looking back at me. That's good. But on that day, what looks back at you in the mirror will be pure and holy and and in in, in all respects like our King Jesus in his humanity, in his glorified humanity, pure and holy, hallelujah, perfection. On that day, it really will be true without any exaggeration. Perfection will be looking back at you from that mirror. Hallelujah. Yes. So what is to be done? Let's very quickly turn to the parallel passage to our text, which is found in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And from verse 1, in fact, let's read verses 1 to 4. Colossians 3, 1 to 4 says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And that word if that opens the chapter is the word since. It's the if of argument. It means since. There's not a question mark being raised here. Since you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, 
where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind. Another way of saying it is set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You remember that's what Paul said about those enemies of the cross of Christ, that they set their affection on things on the earth. They, they were too consumed with everything happening here and making sure that they were a comfortable, un, uh, uh, unobtrusive part of it. But here he says, in contrast, you and I need to set our affection on things above. Set our affection on things above. Oh, set your affection on what pleases the Father. Set your heart on what pleases Him. Set your affection and your focus on what honors the Son of God. Even if it means other people look at you unfavorably here on earth, set yourself to seek out and do those things that honor the Son of God. Set your affection on things of his, the glory of His goodness. You know, no one in heaven doubts that God is good. No, no one in heaven doubts that God is good. They are fully exposed to His goodness. But here's the thing. He's no more good to them up there than He is to us down here. The only problem is we have unbelief. We have doubt because we turn our eye from Jesus to the wind and waves. We begin to sink and we say, well, look at this. Now I'm sinking. Where's, where's the goodness of God? No, set your mind on his goodness. Set your affection on his goodness each and every day. When you climb out of bed, set your heart on the goodness of God. My God is good. And, and he said, seek those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Remember the illustration that we did today. And as you, as you look up, bear in mind and remember where it is you're looking to. You, you're looking up to that one who once came down here and hung on that cross for you and was split open and shed his blood. That's the goodness of God. Set your affection on that. Set your affection on the wisdom of his ways, on the increase of his kingdom, on the fulfillment of his plans and purposes on his never-ending kindness and love. Do, do not set your things, your, your affection, your heart, your mind on the things on this earth because it's easy to do. You can set your mind on the negativity of this age. Very, very easy to, to get sucked into that negativity. There is so much negativity all around us. I, you know there's no negativity in heaven. But down here, there's a bunch of it. And if you set your mind and your focus here on earth, be careful you don't get stuck in that quicksand of negativity and hopelessness and uh, selfishness and ingratitude that exists all around us. Let's lift our head above all of that and look to him who sits on the throne above. It says in verse 3, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. The agenda for your life now is not found in what you see out there or what you can dig down and find in here. The agenda for your life is found there. The pattern for your life is found there. The blueprint for your life, friend, is found there. Who can I, where can I find out where I, who I really am, what I'm supposed to do, what I'm meant to be? That's where you need to look. It's not going to be out here. Well, maybe I'll find it in a minute. Where is it? Your life is hidden with Christ in God. And don't be put off by that word hidden because it's not hidden from you. It's hidden for you. Praise God. Did you hear what I said? It's not hidden from you. It's hidden for you. It's kept safe and secure where no one and nothing can touch it. It's not hidden from you. It's hidden for you. Hallelujah. When, so we're not desperately looking for something that cannot be found, but we're diligently looking to something that cannot be found anywhere else. And that's our life. That's where we find it. All the mercy 
that we need, all the strength that we need, all the wisdom we need, all the hope we need, all the peace we need, all the joy we need, it's right there. The power to overcome, the power to get back up, the power, as Paul was talking about, to just keep pressing on and pressing forward. It's found right there. And it's available for you and I every moment. And it says in verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I like the fact it says when, not if. There's no question about it. He's coming back. Praise the Lord. He is coming back. Scripture foretold it. Jesus himself promised it. He is coming back. And it says, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. What an end. Considering where you began, as we read in Ephesians chapter 2, children of disobedience and wrath, enemies of God, cut off from him, strangers and foreigners. But think about who you are sat in that chair right now today, Christian. Think about who you are. As we contemplate this in closing, think about who you are right now. As a citizen of heaven, as a citizen of God's kingdom with all the legal rights and privileges and protections of that kingdom. But here's also your glorious future. When Christ, when Christ shall appear, then yes, even you shall appear with him in glory. Hallelujah. When Christ comes in the rapture, we will stand before him. We will be changed in the twinkling of an eye so that uh, this mortal puts on immortality. This corruptible puts on incorruption. Hallelujah. When Jesus Christ comes and the dead in Christ rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be changed and be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Hallelujah. And with them into paradise we will go. Oh, into paradise we will go through the pearly gates into our true home into our true home. Anytime any Christian passes away, we say they've gone home to be with the Lord. Remember I said we live from earth to heaven, but, but when we go to that place, where are we going? But home, to that place of our true identity and residency. Hallelujah. And so in that day, when Christ comes, we will be caught up and join him in the Father's house where there, is, there are mansions of plenty and room enough for you and I, and the Son of God has prepared a place for each of his own, where there is no more toil and there is no more trouble and there is no more backbreaking, sweaty work and labor whatsoever. Hallelujah. That's a good place to say, praise the Lord. Where there is no more sorrow, there is no more suffering, where every tear is wiped away. Hallelujah. Where there are pleasures forevermore and joy overflowing in the presence of the Lord God, our most, uh, our most high God, who we will see face to face. Our eye will will behold him. Our hands will handle him. Hallelujah. As we step into that everlasting glory. And just as Jesus said, we will sit down together with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We will sit down together with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We will sit down with Adam and Eve and with Enoch and Noah and with Moses and Elijah and with David and Solomon and with Peter and with James and with John and Paul. We will sit down together with them, praise God. We will sit down together with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene, the first to see Jesus risen. We will sit down together with the thief that died next to the Son of God on the cross, and we will sit down with Stephen, the first to be martyred in his name. We will sit down with all the saints of all the ages, all the other martyrs that there have ever been. We will sit down with Cranmer and Latimer and Ridley, who right here in Oxford were awash with flame as they were burned at the stake for their faith in God. We will sit down in that day with apostles and prophets, with missionaries and evangelists. We will sit down with Sunday school teachers 
teachers and intercessors. We will sit down with cheerful givers. We will sit down with faithful stewards. We will sit down with those who gave their lives in, in spent their lives for the kingdom of God whose names were never known on this earth but who met their master to the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the glory that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. We will sit down at the table of the Lord. Hallelujah. We will sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We will sit down in the presence of the King surrounded by His holy angels. And thus we will ever be with the Lord. We are citizens of heaven. We are only here temporarily. We are only passing through for now. But our ultimate home, our true place is there in that place called heaven. We will sit down together with those loved ones who've gone ahead of us. Some of us right now know who is there waiting for us. Parents are there. Children are there. Husbands and wives are there. Friends are there in that place. But we will reunite with them, never to be parted again. And we will sit down together with them and with 10,000 times 10,000 other saints of God who are complete strangers to us. But in that moment, we'll be closer brothers and sisters to us than any friendship we had in this world. Or we will sit down together in the kingdom of God. And when it's time for the king of kings to come back to this earth, then we will come back with him, robed in white linen, which is the righteousness of the saints, and sat atop white horses. And, and praise God, I've never ridden a horse in my life. I might not until that moment, but I will that day. Hallelujah. Oh, and the horse will obey me when I get on it. <laughs> You won't all be going this way, and here's Hockley going over here, going, no, no, horse, we're supposed to be going this way. No, hallelujah, we will all come with the King of glory, and on the earth every eye will behold him, hallelujah. Oh, every eye will behold him and see him coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and even as he comes, you will be there along with him. Hallelujah, we are citizens of heaven. I'm out of time. Stand to your feet. Let us, until that time, follow Paul's example. Let's press on with a heavenly perspective. Let's march forward, laying aside anything that gets in the way of us eagerly anticipating the return of our King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, thank you that you have made us your children. You have made us citizens of heaven. You have made us royal sons and daughters. You have made us kings and priests unto you, our God. We who were strangers, we who were cut off, we who were far from you have been brought near by your precious son, Jesus. Because of him and his death on that cross for us, because of what he did for us on that tree. We are brought near and we thank you today that we were ushered into the kingdom of God and made citizens of heaven with all the legal rights and protections of that place so that we have, as Pastor Derek has been teaching over these last few weeks, we have the keys of the kingdom. We have exceeding great and precious promises in your word that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, where all those promises are yes and amen through Jesus Christ. You have given us your word, Lord, and your word is forever settled in heaven. Oh, thank you. You've given us the name of Jesus, a rod of authority. Hallelujah. A rock of steadfast hope. You've given us the very name of Jesus Christ by which we can enter into the heavenlies in prayer at any time, calling upon his name and receiving all the, the help and assistance and all the resources of heaven through that name to aid us here in this earth. 
Thank you, Lord, that we are citizens today. Hallelujah. You promised, Lord Jesus, that you would not leave us orphans and you were faithful to your word. You have given us your Holy Spirit to live within us, the very spirit of adoption whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. Yes, God is our Father in this place today. Thank you, Lord, even amidst all the stormy seas and troubles that might be uh, taking place in life all around us. Thank you that we have, we have a hope, we have a steadfast anchor in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that we are citizens of your kingdom. Thank you that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you hold us in your hand and there is none who can deliver out of your hand. Thank you that you are faithful and you are true to your promise that where you are, there we will be also. So that day is coming, Lord. Help us. Forgive us when we've, we've not craned and stretched our necks. Forgive us when we've been too focused on the things of this world. Forgive us when we've been like Peter, looking at the wind and waves rather than looking at your holy face. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Forgive us and, and show mercy to us today. Help us to lift up our eyes to where you are seated above or where our true life is, where our true purpose is, where our true hope is, where our help is. Oh, thank you, Lord. Help us to look to you today. In the name of Jesus Christ, help us to fix our eyes on you, King of glory. And help us to keep in mind that, yes, you're sat there right now at the Father's right hand. But the time is coming soon when you will return and call us to be with you. Help us, help us to, as we heard from Chuck some weeks ago, help us to occupy until you come. Help us to be about your business and be about serving you until you come. But even in our serving, even in our working, let us not forget, let us not neglect that a day is coming when you will return and you will call us to be with you. And we will, we will meet with you in the air, Lord Jesus. We look forward to it, that day when our eyes behold you come, when the last trumpet sounds out and we rise with the dead in Christ to meet you in the air. We look forward to that, that day, Lord, when we can join with all the saints in your holy presence. Thank you, Lord. We didn't have to work for these things. Thank you, Lord. We didn't have to strive to earn these things. They are the free gift of God. Thank you. They are all by grace. We thank you today. We praise you today that our lives are secure in your hand. We thank you today. There is no weapon formed against us that shall be able to prosper. Oh, hallelujah. There is no weapon that shall be able to prosper because we are shielded and surrounded. Oh, and even though our bodies might be here on this earth, in the spirit we are seated in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that is our true position. Thank you, Lord, that is our true place. Hallelujah. Thank you, that is our true seat at your table. Hallelujah. In the paradise of God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I just pray, Father, uplift your people today. Encourage your children today that they are not like mere mortal men and women, but they are born of the Spirit. Hallelujah. They are made in the image of Jesus Christ. And one day even their very bodies will be made in his image. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, let us go from this place rejoicing in Jesus Christ with no confidence in the flesh, but rejoicing in all the hope that we are the saved, we are the redeemed of God, hallelujah. Oh, and our future is secure because it is held in the hands of Jesus Christ. Now just lift up your voice and praise the Lord one last time. Just give him glory right now. Just give him thanks right now. Just honor him right now. Just lift up your eyes right now. Even if those eyes have been hanging low this week, looking at circumstances around you, lift up your eyes to heaven right now. For for where your help comes from is right there where Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God. That help you need for your child. That help you need in your finances. That help you need in your relationship. That help you need in your emotions. It's right there. It's right there at the right hand of God. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We bless your name. We thank you, Lord. 
We thank you, Lord. We look forward to your coming. We rejoice because you are coming, oh God, to bring peace to this earth. Thank you, Lord, that what governments cannot do. Thank you, God, that what world leaders cannot do. Thank you, God, that what no civilization has ever done, you will do in a moment when you return. Thank you, God, that you will bring an end to war. Thank you, God, that you will bring an end to violence. Thank you, God, that the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord as water the sea. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that when the kingdom of God comes, all the kingdoms of this earth shall become the kingdom of our God from the north, the south, the east, and the west, everywhere. The name of Jesus Christ, not as a curse, but as a blessed Lord and Savior, the name will ring out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that even now, even now, you made your power available. Help us, Jesus. Help us to live not from earth to heaven, but from heaven to earth. Help us even as we start this week, God, as Sunday becomes Monday. Help us this week to to live with a new kind of thinking, to live with a new attitude, to live with a new focus, to live knowing that we're not looking to heaven as the place in the sweet by and by. Oh, but we're looking to that place where we in the Spirit are rooted right now with all the power and resource of heaven to work in our lives Help us this week, oh God, to live from heaven to earth. And may you be glorified in all, King Jesus. And if you believe it, say amen Amen. and give him praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's good to see Pete fired up. Praise God. Thanks for firing us up, Pete. Praise God. Wonderful. Well, we're going to have to close the service now. Remember, there's an evening service as well. And uh, do come back this evening if you are able to. And uh, Jose will be sharing this evening. God bless you. Have a great week. Amen.